All right. Well, our guest today is a fantastic writer and journalist who just released his first book, The Big 100, The New World of Super Aging, that you can pick up digitally or wherever books are sold. Welcome, William J. Cole, to the 323. Thank you, sir, for being here. It's such a pleasure to be with you, Reed. Yes, yes, yes. I, I'm, I'm very excited to have you on here because this is a topic that I really love talking about. I talk about it all the time with my mom. And so this is fascinating now to get into, especially with everything that's going on in the world. And the topic of aging has just been always been so fascinating. And with these continued advancements that we have in healthcare and just how people seek to take care of themselves personally. And with just, I think how we all take a deep look more, you know, with our mortality as we at different points in life, what was it about aging and specifically advanced age that drove you the most to take a deep dive and write this book? Well, I think I've been sort of um, fascinated with the very old for my whole life. And it really traces back to um, my grandmother, who lived almost to 104. She wow. was bo born in 1899 and she died in 2003. So her life touched parts of three centuries. <laughs> How many of us can say that? You know? Oh, yeah. So that was sort of, I always was fascinated with her. And then uh, when I was based in Paris as a foreign correspondent for the Associated Press, I was assigned to write about Jeanne Calment, who um, was the oldest person, still is the oldest person who ever lived, uh, whose age could be authenticated by records. And she lived to 122 years and 164 days. So, you know, covering that story, the story of her remarkable life, more or less turned a fascination into a full-blown obsession. And then fast forward to a couple of years ago, we're in the middle of COVID, and I had the idea to just check and see uh, how are the 100-year-olds doing with COVID. And uh, uh, it turned out not very well, as you might expect, you know. Uh, but in the course of talking with some experts uh, about centenarians, I realized that we're about to see a huge wave of them. Uh, our, our population's aging and the numbers of people living to 100 spiking. That's curious. That, that makes me very curious with one of the big questions that I had and from some of our co-hosts on here, us mid 90s born kids, how, what's the life expectation for us going forward? Well, you know, uh, Look, some of this is, is a little counterintuitive because, you know, COVID hit our lifespans, our life expectancies right across the board and lowered them. Uh, the thing is, is that experts are expecting us to rebound from that uh, as early as this year. And uh, so there's a few things going on. One is that um, one in every two five-year-olds alive right now is projected to live to 100. So, uh, you know, there's, there seems to be a, nobody, I don't think anybody's really looked specifically at um, millennials and Gen Z, but you can say fairly confidently that the, the trend lines are all moving towards longer lives and a greater chance of hitting a triple digit age for all of us. That's exciting. That's exciting. And my mom, she's a fixture on the show. <laughs> We love the conversations that we get on here, but Mama Murphy flips, she flip flops with the idea of aging a lot. And it's a conversation that we had. Sometimes she's down for the, the gracefulness and beauty in it. And other times she's telling me like vehemently, this sucks. Don't get old. And I hear that from, I hear that from relatives like all my life. And I used to joke that I'd never want to live to a hundred because the natural thought I think for many is living, looking feeling like respectfully to centenarians the the crip keeper is what my idea of 100 always was that's not the case though anymore is it it like what would you say is the quality of life for the average person 100 or over i mean it really varies reed you know uh, we all age differently uh and so you know old age looks differently to all of us and some of that is because of our genetics and some of that is just because of our behaviors so just to back up for a second and explain why are why why should we expect more people to live to 100? Um, 
I already mentioned the, the five-year-olds, half of them projected to live to 100. That is because of just continued medical breakthroughs uh, in treating cancer and heart disease um, and other things that kill us. And so that's why, you know, the, the experts at Stanford University's Center on Longevity are making that rather bold projection uh, for, for very young kids, for kids in uh, Generation Alpha. And um, that's, that's the medical piece. Then there's a demographic piece. It's just the boomers like me, you know, uh, who are aging. And the baby boom generation is a big one. There's a, well over 70 million of us. The oldest of us um, is around 77 right now. So in the next 25 years, the fittest of those people will start to hit 100. And because there's so many of them, it's just going to push the numbers of centenarians uh, significantly higher. In fact, it's it's going to uh, increase eight times between now and 2050. So that's why that's that's sort of a, a nutshell, of, you know, of why we're looking at this phenomenon. As far as you know, what's life going to be like? You know, it's it's a little bit of a crapshoot. You know, some people age well. Uh, you know, they're genetically sort of predisposed to to live uh, healthy and have a good long health span to go with that lifespan. And then there are people who, you know, not so much. Right. You know, and then the thing that we all fear the most, I think, isn't even our physical health as much as it is our mental and cognitive abilities, you know, and people who suffer from dementia and Alzheimer's, you know, who wants to live to 100 with that? So I think it depends, you know, and 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 uh, my book sort of also uh, looks at some challenges to our, you know, to what the landscape will look like for a hundred year society. Exactly. And again, the book is The Big 100, The New World of Super Aging. Uh, Bill, you brought up demographics just now, and I'm curious to dive a little more into that because I've, I've seen on Twitter your fantastic follow on Twitter. Everybody should go find them. You've discussed the divide in age longevity among races with, I believe the stat I saw was white Americans on average living nearly six years longer than black people and eight and 10 U.S. centenarians being white. So can you tell me more about what you've learned regarding race and even economic inequity when it comes to aging? Sure. Uh, you know, these were the biggest surprises that I found as I did the research for the book. I knew that white people had a longevity advantage. I just didn't realize how pronounced it was. And it's kind of depressing, you know? I mean, <laughs> life at its essence is about time and white people get more time. And why is that? You know, uh, a, a lot of reasons. I mean, uh, health outcomes uh, for people of color tend to be poorer. Uh, you know, there, there are higher incidences of heart disease, diabetes uh, in, in communities of color. We saw this in COVID. And, and this is, you know, in large measure why uh, COVID hit uh, communities of color disproportionately hard because the, the underlying health issues were, were greater there. So these are things that we can fix and we, we've got to fix them. I mean, for me, and I argue this in the book, but I don't think it really needs argument. Uh, how can we, how can we be content to to see this longevity gap and not close it? it to me, it it feels like a moral question. It it really does because when you think and you do think about that, <laughs> you see, there's no reason. You obviously see that there's a problem, and we see that often in the country. You see that there's a problem that needs to be fixed with this, and. We want everybody to live as long as possible and to live as happily. Absolutely. As exactly. Now, I'm curious, with all the research you had to do and the sources that you had to speak to, what were some of the most fascinating things that you discovered about longevity? What were some of the what was something that like really caught you maybe off guard, really surprised you that you heard from any of these people that you got to talk to? And even the people who you spoke with that are up there, like who was the most interesting? Oh gosh, uh, so many surprises and uh, and so many interesting things. 
Uh, first of all, you had mentioned in addition to uh, racial gaps and ethnic gaps in how long we live, uh, there's an income piece of it. And I, I didn't really know that. Uh, I guess it, it makes sense. But, you know, rich people get more time. Uh, people who have college degrees, four-year college degrees, live longer than people who don't. And there have been, you know, very extensive studies that have, uh, you know, documented that. And the reasons are, you know, many. People with college degrees tend to get better jobs. They, they have jobs where they're able to work in air-conditioned buildings, uh, whether that's remotely or, you know, at a company. So they're not out, you know, making a hard living in, in the heat. Uh, you know, they have, they have uh, uh, less of a likelihood of smoking. They tend to advocate for themselves at the doctor's office more aggressively than people who don't have any college. They can uh, go they to speak, the doctor's office. They can get Yeah, it. well, that's right, exactly. So there's like a whole litany of things, you know, that um, having money helps, you know, and it's, <laughs> You know, we say that money can't buy you love, but it turns out it can help you lease more life. And, and that's another inequity because we have a lot of that in our country. Um, and it's something that's fixable if we if we care to, to, to do something about it. That, that was a big surprise. I think just the extent of that um, and, and the, the gaps between the haves and the have nots that goes right, right to, again, how much time we get to live and to love. Uh, and to work and create and contribute. Um, other things that surprised me, uh, the role of positivity in lengthening our lives. We, you know, we, we talked about genes a little bit and we can, we can probably talk more about that. Uh, a, lot, a lot of getting to 100 depends on our genetic wiring, you know, but um, getting to 90, uh, means it sort of uh, depends about 75% on our behaviors. So these are things like our diet, our, uh, whether we exercise or not, um, sun exposure, smoking, certainly, things like that. Um, and, then, and then once you get to 90, uh, it starts to flip and genetics plays an increasingly uh, greater role. So by the time you get to 100, the genetics piece is probably about 50%. At play, by the time you get to 105, uh, 75% is genetics. And then it just goes up sharply from there. So there are things we can do. And one of the things that we can do is be positive. Uh, and, and it adds life to, you know, it, it's really amazing. I mean, there, there one study uh, at Harvard suggested that it could add as much as seven and a half years to our lifespan by being positive and, you know, sort of keeping our chin up and, and looking on the bright side. All stuff that sounds, frankly, a little Pollyannish and a little, you know, BS maybe uh, at first blush, but it turns out that it, it really, you know, there's a mysterious interplay between our minds and our bodies. That makes me, that makes me happy. It makes me feel positive to hear because that's a that's how I try to live life. That's what we try to do with the show. I mean, you can see the colors behind you. Yeah. Right now with how bright and positive it all is. That's a good that's a good way to go. Now, I don't want to go from positivity and be a complete downer on the topic, but there are I I like exploring this route on here that the first route to explore is climate change and this advanced Sorry about my cat jumping in the middle here. Hi, come on. It's Friday the 13th and you have a black cat in the shot. How cool is that? She's brown, so she's not perfect. Oh, she's just, okay. she's, but she's fantastically unlucky. For oh, here we go. Now I see yeah. like calico almost. Beautiful. Yeah, awesome. yeah. She's, she's also a fixture on this show. She's knocked out the audio several times. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> but. Uh, it gets nine lives. So that's even more than what we're talking about. If she gets nine lives, I'm ready to take seven of them right now. <laughs> but climate change and this advanced extreme weather that we're dealing with, this rapidly changing earth earth that we live on, and I have the question of how do we cope with the idea of advanced aging when it also feels like we could outlive our own planet? I'm so glad you asked that, Reed. Honestly, this is sort of the the, the wild card uh, in, in all of this. I mean... You know, if if we don't do something about the climate crisis, we're not going to have any longevity, uh, you know, much less extreme longevity. 
Uh, I mentioned the boomers aging. And uh, so we're going to see more people living to 100, you know, whether they like it or not, actually. Uh, so for at least a time, there will be more centenarians. And that could coincide with the worst that the climate has to throw at us. It could make for a very unpleasant triple digit experience for some people. Because, you know, who wants to live to 100 years on a planet ravaged by extreme weather? And as a consequence of that, uh, economic instability, um, you know, political insecurity, all of that. So it's, it, it's really, um, it's, it, it's even more important that we do something about the climate crisis. And, you know, what about you know, those five-year-olds we talked about? Half of them projected to live to 100. We owe it to them. To, to fix this, or at least slow it down. Exactly. If you give me one second, I'm going to kick her out because now she's <laughs> ripping up cardboard. We have a climate crisis and a cat crisis. That is my biggest concern as well. Like when we talk about, you know, with the, how this expectancy for five-year-olds now, it's not going to be a great uh, quality of life when you're having to you're seeing like in florida people hurrying off the coast to get to places like orlando because there's going to be like no miami in a while there everything is just going that way and you have politicians handling it and that's the other route i want to go in with this topic is the literal political aspect of aging and where you stand with the advanced ages of many politicians because it's been a huge topic recently especially with you have uh 81 year old house minority leader mitch mcconnell having a couple of very scary episodes on the job that leaves people asking about things like term limits and age caps on political roles and i can see the legitimacy in some calls of ageism in these discussions but does it concern you at all that our top candidates for leading the nation are 80 and 77 because even if they're sharp and fit and one of them doesn't particularly strike me as either of those but no matter what the arrest records say these roles especially potus take a lot out of even the youngest members of congress and any political roles where do you stand on like age caps and limits yeah i think this is a, of concern to all of us you know it's really top of mind uh and it's become a, a huge part of the American conversation. You're right. We have to avoid ageism. Uh, it's a tricky thing to deal with because we decided as a country way back in 1967 that uh, age discrimination in the workplace would be illegal. And so how do we fix this and not break the law? You know, um, we it, it's really tricky. Again, I, as I said at the outset, we all age differently. So it's hard to impose, uh, you know, standards on everyone, everyone, you know, some people, we've all met these people, you know, I, my mom is 92 years old, still living independently in the house I grew up in, in Massachusetts. And she's spry as hell, man. She just, I, we, my wife and I put up a video on TikTok of her walking through the grocery store. We could barely keep up with her. You know, it's almost, it's got almost a hundred thousand views, you know, my mom, you know, just, <laughs> You know, and then we've met people in their 60s who look ancient and active, you know. So it's very it's very difficult, I think, to impose uh, standards. But we have to we have to do something. The median age uh, of, of Americans is uh, just under 40 years old. It's like 39.5, something like that. That's the median age. Only 5% of Congress is under 40. So, you know, we say we have a representative democracy, but there are a lot of people in our country who don't feel represented. And, uh, you know, that's a problem. So it, it feels like maybe it's time to revisit the idea of term limits, at least, you know, so that we get more, you know, turnover. In, in Congress. And there are a lot of sharp older people with a lot of experience and ideas, and it's good to have them. It's just, you know, were these jobs really meant to be, you know, lifetime forever jobs? Yeah. I mean, uh, Mitch McConnell has been in the Senate since 1982. 
yeah. or 86, somewhere. I can't, I'm confusing him with Dianne Feinstein, who just died, who was also, you know, a U.S. senator for about that same time, like 41 years. That's and a long time. I don't care if you're sharp as a tack or not. At some point, I think our older politicians need to have the self-awareness to know when to step aside and let let a younger generation rise. I fully agree. And you said like with Feinstein, like she was she had just been talking about reelection potentially even there at age 90. And I I agree that so there's there is plenty to gain from having wisdom in Congress and people who have gone through the experience and have gone through all of this who can, you know, to have them delve that out to the younger members of the parties, it helps having an Elizabeth Warren who is very spry, who is very, um, you know, witty and ready to go. It helps having somebody like that, but it gets scary when you see Mitch McConnell freeze up uh, at the podium or if I'm seeing President Biden riding his bike and I'm 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 legitimately afraid for him to fall or something it, it's kind of scary to see yeah I mean with Biden you know I I think sometimes he takes uh you know needless hits about that because look he he is 80 and he is riding his bike he's he's pretty fit actually yeah. And, uh, you know, biologically, he's probably a, a lot younger than than chronologically. Uh, you know, that said, we're not the same at 80 as we are at, you know, 45. We're just not. We, there are changes to our brains, even the size of our brains. We, 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 our brains shrink a little bit, you know, um, in our it begins in our I think our 30s and you know, by, by those ages, we've lost a tenth of the size of our brains. And uh, with that can lead some, to, you know, some uh, abilities to, uh, to you know, multitask and, and stuff like that. So it's, it's, really, uh, it's really problematic. I mean, you know, we, um, we've never had an older Congress. So one in, in four members of, of the House and Senate together is uh, over 70. And of course, we have the oldest occupant of the Oval Office we've ever had. So time to definitely think about about this. Uh, I think, you know, I think a lot of older people would happily vote for younger uh, politicians. Uh, it's just, you know, our Constitution sets age limits, too. For You know, you have to be a certain age before you can run for these federal offices. There's no upper limit. There's a, a lower limit. And uh, so hopefully we can you know, find a, a place where we can address this, where we don't impose ageist or discriminatory, uh, you know, conditions on fit, smart, you know, energetic, older people. Right. Again, you can get Bill Cole's new book, The Big 100, The New World of Super Aging, anywhere you get books or online. I got one last question before you go to tie some Sports in here, because this is a sports variety show. We're going to tie it in here. We're talking advanced ages. You just had Tom Brady retire from the NFL at 45. It still looks like he could go. Uh, LeBron James is now the oldest player in the NBA at 38 and still dominant. I I feel like Bartolo Colon is still trying to roll out and play somewhere. Could we start to see more athletes retiring at later and later ages? Could we get Tom Brady as a Washington commander at a hundred. Can I finally have that? I, I want Tom Brady back with the new England Patriots, my team, you know, <laughs> which is just, they are just sucking wind. I mean, it's just, it's miserable, but uh, don't even get me started, you know, but, and I, and I expect zero sympathy from your listeners about poor Bill, the Patriots fan. But anyway, we, <laughs> We Carl dove into that very recently. Just last night, we dove headfirst into the Patriots and the whole situation with Bill Belichick, who is who is an aging. He's one of the older coaches in the NFL. And he I, is, you know. Yeah. Well, you know, we we had our winning ways for a long time, and all I can say is karma is a bitch, you know. <laughs> but yeah, to your question, absolutely. I think you know. Look, football is a pretty rough sport, so necessarily people will have to exit. The playing field at a certain age we're not going to see anybody at 100 uh you know uh doing a pick six but um 
But you know, I, I'm a I'm a competitive uh, distance athlete, a runner. I've I've, I've run a, a ton of marathons. I competed back in college. I'm 62 now. I'll be 63 next month. Uh, I follow some athletes who are in their hundreds, who are out on the track setting world records for their age group in the hundred meters. And you know, there's this one woman uh, in uh, New Orleans. Uh, Julia Hurricane Hawkins, she's called, and she's 105 and holds the world record for the 100 meter dash. Damn. Uh, so you know, I, I, that's cool, right? I mean, that's very inspiring. Mm -hmm. And I think you know, uh, you know, if people want to stay active and they want to keep uh, keep doing these things, I, more power to them. I, it's really inspiring. We love it. We love it. Go get this man's book. It's a topic that we can all find a reason to dive into, and he'll educate you plenty with it. The Big 100, The New World of Super Aging. Thank you, Bill, for being on the show. Thanks, Reed. May you live 100 years. I appreciate you. Same to you, sir. Okay. All the best.